everyone. Thanks for tuning into this week's Matter Loading Session. As always, I'm Nina. As always, I'm Kyle. We'll tackle some of the spicy issues to come out this week. We're gonna go from small stories to big stories, human stories to governments to countries. We'll end with stories about the environment, which of course concerns all of us. Let's start off by talking about the controversial Bello ad. If you haven't seen the ad, good for you. But basically, it's a woman sitting on a couch watching the news about the pandemic, whether e- ECQ, MECQ, GCQ, whatever, and they're gradually getting quote unquote ugly and like gaining weight and they're gaining blemishes and basically the ad wants you to feel bad I guess and then it ends by saying tough times call for beautiful measures and this is an example of what is called inadequacy marketing it's when you market something by making someone feel bad about a certain feature they have and then you advertise a particular solution to that and the beauty industry has been using this for a long time the Bello Medical Group is not any different they say that the ad is merely a reminder that if you're ready to make a decision to take care of yourself again they're there to help but obviously a lot of people didn't like that messaging the ad was swiftly taken off and the giggle group which made the ad as well as the bello medical group issued statements of apologies like later on like a few days after so i guess as much as the issue was resolved a lot of people are still talking about what it means about like the beauty standards we place and all those yeah so that's one way to look at the issue which is as nina said the prevalence of inadequacy marketing another thing that you could take a look at is the fact that it was just made i know a lot of people who got shocked that it even made it to the air because usually they go through several audience tests before they release an advertisement like this so there are two possibilities in my opinion it's either they didn't do the test which means that they were just being bad at their jobs which means that they don't really care too much about how it affects people by not doing the test or they did do the test and the audience did not really pick up on these really bad shamey things so either way you need to confront some really harsh realities about you know our societal condition where even if you have had an audience test the fact that it made it to the air just means that the common person who is probably not that vocal in social media or anything they're probably saying that "Mm, yeah this is an okay ad to run it's okay to make people feel bad if they have pimples if they have long armpit hair stuff like that which leads us to the next but doesn't really lead us to the next one but i don't have i never prepped a transition so whatever no transitions tonight let's talk about the britney spears conservatorship um britney spears as you might have known has been under conservatorship for 13 years following a very public mental breakdown in 2008 and under a conservatorship a conservator in this case her father jamie spears will handle not only her finances but also major decisions quote unquote for her own protection or supposedly for her own protection but as we now know jamie spears has been profiting millions from the conservatorship as britney was forced to work but also at the same time prevented from making crucial decisions with regard to her her own body her own money her family whether or not she can get married or even have children even decisions regarding her health like what kind of medication to take for her mental health issues her reproductive choices and this led of course to the rise of the free britney movement so the update here is that jamie spears filed a comment to the initial petition of britney trying to get her dad removed as a conservator and you'd be happy to know that jamie spears has stepped down as conservator and promises to cooperate with the court on a transition plan for britney to exit the conservatorship there's still loose ends of course so that's between britney and her father jamie spears lawyer for their part is saying that there, these attacks are unjustified there aren't any real reasons for him to be disqualified as conservator and that just he's doing this just because he unconditionally loves Britney Spears but keep in mind that even though Jamie Spears is gone that doesn't mean that the battle is over she's still under conservatorship the characters are just going to change for now and this should also not stop overall conversations about conservatorship in general so I feel like there are lots of things that we can talk about in relation to this one of them is guardianship which is similar to a conservator except it's for the elderly and it's also abused to a large extent especially in the United States but that's a story for another time but the main debatable issue here is should we even allow these kinds of conservatorships to exist in this particular form should we allow other people to make decisions for anybody else especially when there's a gray area with regard to their mental capacity to do something yeah so our next news now looks more into local issues the COA talked about the 67 billion of the DOH that were misused or as they call it deficiencies of the Department of Health in terms of managing the pandemic fund noted that these things contributed to the challenges faced by the agency in responding to COVID-19 among the issues highlighted by state auditors were irregularities with the procurement process 
and the lacking documentation in various contracts entered into by the DOH. So that's a really big red flag. COA also pointed out that some medical equipment and supplies purchased for the pandemic response were either unused or not immediately used due to the lack of planning. So a lot of things were wasted in terms of money and even equipment when the money was used properly were not implemented as well as they could have. So meanwhile, the DOH claimed that the funds flagged by COA are actually accounted for and the amounts were all spent for the purchase of necessary medical supplies and payment for medical workers, etc. So there seems to be a battle between these two departments. I just saw a funny post actually that the DOH are looking for attorneys and people were memeing it saying that it was related to the COA audit. So, you know, we'll see how this unfolds. But it's a big red flag that a lot of money again is misused, missing, whatever you want to call it. Obviously, there might be corruption in play here. It comes in many forms. Either the money is being pocketed or people are buying things for overpriced uh, prices or they might be buying things that are unnecessary like really expensive laptops for gaming when all you need to do is excel yeah well to be fair to them i do understand like the initial impulse to say oh i really need a good laptop because i am going to have to process like mountains and mountains of data but that's a way that corruption happens and i feel like debaters and people in general just think that corruption is you're gonna just take some money and put it in your pocket but like that's not just the only way that corruption happens a more common way is the government does allow um government officials or government employees to have certain things using taxpayers' money in order for them to do their job well. And one of those is, for example, service cars that are enjoyed by government officials. A typical practice is you would see a lot of these service cars being bought for exorbitant amounts of money. And this is the reason why Duterte, for all his faults, I congratulate, I, I commend him for imposing a limit on that such that you cannot, if you're a government official, you can't have a service car worth more than 1 million pesos. It feels like that's what's happening here, where you go like i need a laptop in order to process a lot of this information and then they go around and get the most expensive the coolest laptop that all the rich kids want and you end up having it because of taxpayers money so that's one of the explanations that i can think of i'm not sure if this is the real reason why you know they spent 137,000 on the laptop an alternative explanation is that they overstated the amount that they had to spend and then they pocketed the difference i'm not sure this is all speculation for me but i'm pretty sure that those things happen regularly anyway but next story that we're gonna talk about is this rumor about how certain employers impose a no vaccine no work policy yeah the department of labor and employment better known as dole has received reports of companies allegedly enforcing a no vaccine no work policy which means basically that people are not allowed to work so long as they're not vaccinated and it has yet to receive any formal complaint on the matter right so there's no formal complaint but there are rumors that this is taking place and this actually goes against an earlier statement where dole said that employees should not be discriminated against in terms of their employment based on their vaccination status and a vaccination card is also not a requirement for employment they added that employers cannot coerce workers into getting vaccinated but only encourage them so you might say that this is a way to encourage people to get their vaccines but you can also say that it might be overstepping their boundaries like kyle and i have differing opinions here i think principally speaking there is something that is sort of a red flag um, and private companies should not use a policy like this, but I do understand where they're coming from. Yeah, I feel like it's all con context specific. Like if you have an employer that has given you the opportunity to get vaccinated, like they, procru they procured the vaccines for you, but then you chose not to take it. I feel like in that situation, the employer has the right to say, if you're not going to get vaccinated, unfortunately, we can't ne let you near the premises. But even that is debatable because what if it was a religious reason why they did it? What if they had a philosophical reason for why they refused to take a vaccine? And in the past, you've had a lot of these reasons being honored. Unless there's a compelling reason, you cannot really compel them. And this has never even been tested on the level of private employers. Maybe they can do certain rules. Is that a valid form of discrimination? Those kinds of things. Because discrimination, you know, treating people differently based on certain factors is not absolutely banned, you know? Like, if two groups of people were substantially different, then it's okay for you to treat them differently. But 
the question now is is this one of those exceptions where you can make those different um you can make those different treatments depending on a certain factor like whether or not they have a vaccine so that's where we're at right now again i feel like this could be debatable but it really is context specific in you know reality where you can't just say that oh this is entirely not a good policy or this is entirely a good policy there's probably levels to it within a spectrum that we should be aware of but this leads us to the next story which is Isko Moreno being slammed by Duterte. So what yeah. happened here is Duterte was making personal attacks against an unnamed official. Though everyone kind of had a feeling who it was, but the content of the attack makes people believe it was Isko Moreno, right? So Isko Moreno used to work in show business as an actor, but even before that, he was trying to make it as a model. So they had pictures of themselves in undergarments, and when Duterte was attacking politicians who were wearing briefs and bikinis in photos, people thought that it, it was about Isko. It could have also been about Moka Uson, but at the time, right, the heat was on Isko. So everyone knew that Duterte kind of had an incentive to attack Isko in this particular way. And predictably, you saw a lot of trolls and DDS individuals attacking Isko as a resort, uh, or, <laughs> as a result, sorry. And you had Harry Rocket denying everything, saying that Duterte did not actively, um, you know, inspire people to do this. But, you know, the trends point otherwise. Yeah, the story has two parts. The before part and the after. The before is the idea that, well, a lot of people want Isko Moreno to run with with Lenny Robredo, that would probably be for vice president. And recall also that Duterte himself was planning on running for vice president, which we covered a couple of weeks ago. So people are speculating that Duterte is now using his platform to begin like black propaganda against a potential opponent before the campaign season even starts. So this sort of demonstrates that even in the marketplace of ideas, the marketplace of politicians, there can still be abuses of dominance between like an incumbent and a potential like opponent in, in a future election. But the after story comes in Cavite Governor John Vicar Mulia sided with Isco Moreno on Facebook when they said, if you ask me this a non-issue, what's important is that he never lied, he didn't steal, he didn't kill, or ever brought shame to the great people of Manila as a public servant, and emphasizing that criticisms about a political rival should be about their ability as a public servant and not pot shots based on their past or the time that they were young. And previously, the reason why this is important is that Remulia had been a key Duterte ally, specifically in 2020 when we were experiencing the pandemic and we had the lockdown, John Vicar Mulia was a very key voice in recommending certain things to the president but even in 2016 people had been previously expecting that he would support be nice presidential run but then he switched support to Duterte and so it sounds to me like Duterte's old hold on allies is getting kind of shaky even if Duterte says that's not really about Isco they're still alienating potentially people who are supportive of him so now he's alienating even his own allies in the process of you know doing this black propaganda against others and speaking of black propaganda let's take a look at one person who, you know, is a woman, she's a politician, and has been a target of a lot of troll attacks, Risa Conteveros, who called for a suspension of our rate hikes. So in this story, Morelco, for the fifth month in a row, announced that its August rates will increase by almost 10 centavos per kilowatt hour. That would be equivalent to a 19 peso increase for households consuming 200 kilowatt hours per month. And the reason why the halt was being called for is that the Energy Regulatory Commission has not yet explained the rise in electricity costs, and there's currently a probe into the rotational blackouts affecting a lot of us right now, especially Especially, well, not exclusively, I wouldn't even say especially, but like we do feel this in the debate scene where a lot of tournaments would experience people having to disconnect because of rotational blackouts. But this matters because, number one, in other agencies, there was no similar price hike. Merelco had said it was due to higher quote unquote ancillary services, but it's not really clear what exactly makes these services require higher charges. The electricity market, and this is for me what's worth noting for debate, you know, context, the electricity market is highly regulated by the ERC, which is meant to ensure under the law that electricity is priced rationally so the way that this works is you have you know the erc and before Meralco or any electricity company before they can increase the hikes they have to send the proposed rates the new rates to the erc for approval so that's the way that you know you can control the prices as the government the problem is um in the meantime while the review is pending the these rates can be approved on a provisional basis so those provisional rate increases there isn't really a remedy for this other than the fact that if it is later rejected, they have to roll it back and they have to refund people who have had to pay more as a result of that price hike. And we've seen this instance already happen in the past. 
if you are aware, when the pandemic started, a lot of people were complaining that their bills were somewhat higher than they usually were. And a lot of people said that could be because of the fact that everyone's at home and using all the devices, but other people pointed out that the anomalies were too huge to disregard. And so after a while, some people actually got refunded by Meralco. So it proved that there might have been an actual price hike that not a lot of people were aware of. So that's it for local news. Let's go to the international scene because a lot of interesting happened. A, a lot of interesting things are happening abroad. So Sudan's dictator was handed over to the ICC recently. So Sudan will hand over its ruler, Omar al-Bashir. If you're familiar with who that hit is, if you're not, then you should probably read up more because debaters have been talking about this ruler for quite a while. In the decades scene. now, actually. Yeah. Decades now, yeah. And they were handed to the International Criminal Court along with two other officials wanted for the Darfur conflict. If you don't know what that conflict is, it's fine. It happened in 2003. But basically, al-Bashir, who is 77, now has been wanted by the ICC for more than 10 years over charges of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity in the Sudanese region. So the United Nations says that 300,000 people were killed and 2.5 million people were displaced during the Darfur conflict, which erupted in the vast western region, right? During the year of 20, oh, sorry, 2003. Yes, and the cabinet's decision to hand him over came during a visit by ICC Chief Prosecutor Khan, but it still needs to be discussed because it's unclear if al-Bashir would be extradited to face trial in the hog hey 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 or you know the face trial in sudan I think it's worth noting again that the ICC or the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction to again try genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. So if you need a refresher on that, we did talk about it in our previous episode about genocide like around 50 episodes ago or more than 50 episodes ago. But it's there. It's there on the Spotify. Just scroll down, I guess. Um, But another thing that's worth noting here is that why are we questioning like whether they will go to The Hague or like remain in Sudan? The reason for that is even if you don't try them in The Hague, there is a very strong possibility that Sudan, just like most countries in the world, they have quote-unquote domesticated um, international law. Uh, so as you may know, these um, crimes against humanity, genocide, war crimes, they are criminalized by the Rome Statute. Um, but even if you are not a party to that, there are most most countries have put it in their statute books like, yeah, genocide is a crime that you could be, you know, tried for even if you are not a party to the Rome Statute anymore. So if you take a look at the Philippines, even if Duterte has successfully pulled out of the Rome Statute or pulled out of the ICC, they can still be tried under our domestic, you know, um, law that is similarly um, criminalizing genocide and crimes against humanity and war crimes. But our next story is about Iran's new hardline president being sworn in. So Abraham Raisi is a, an extremely conservative cleric who was sworn in as president recently and before his election, he was the head of Iran's judiciary, spent much of his career as a prosecutor, and is on a U.S. sanctions list over his human rights record. And Raisi, um, when he was elected, the election was actually skipped by many Iranians who saw it as being rigged in his favor. So he takes office not only in a controversial manner, but also during a turbulent time. Because Iran is facing a lot of economic weakness. They have to worry about the pandemic. They have to worry about the water shortage. They have to worry about American sanctions. But also tensions are running high with Israel because officials of Israel have accused Iran of carrying out a deadly drone attack last week on an oil tanker in the Indian Ocean and the oil tanker was managed by an Israeli company. Israel may soon retaliate for that attack. You have seen in the past that Iran has been consistently being, you know, involved in these sort of cases. Most notably, they were a party to the to the oil platforms case, which is one of the landmark decisions of the International Court of Justice, which every law student has had to read, including myself. But enough about that. That's extremely important, but we don't have enough information to talk about the new hardline president other than the fact that he's a hardline president. Right now, what we can talk about is our next story, which is about the decriminalization of sex work in Australia. Yeah, so in a place called Victoria in Australia, they criminalize, decriminalize sex work, ensuring sex workers have access to the same rights as any other Victorian employee, regardless of who they work for, whether it's themselves, a small employer, or a large company. And decriminalization recognizes that sex work is legitimate work and should be regulated through standard business laws like any other industry in this. So the government will remove offenses and criminal penalties for consensual, consensual sex work and repealing public health offenses. They'll also repeal the Sex Work Act of 1994 to instead regulate sex work through existing government agencies and business regulation. And they'll also update and modernize planning, public health, and anti-discrimination laws to support a decriminalized system. So 
obviously this is a great news for a lot of people in the area this has been an issue that a lot of people have been fighting for for a while a lot of debaters have been discussing so it's nice to see certain strides being made in other countries and hopefully see them being applied in other places as well but decriminalization does not mean that non-consensual sex is going to be okay obviously the state is still going to be against abuses there are still going to be laws in place to ensure that children are protected as well as women overall yeah and this is like a big deal because even today there isn't a real feminist consensus about whether or not sex work is a feminist thing like i know feminists from either side of the issue but what everyone can agree with is that for people who are already in sex work they should at the very least not be further victimized so if you're the kind of feminist who thinks that sex work is like victimizing women you should still celebrate this because they would not be further victimized or further coerced into things that you know they would wouldn't be wanting and if you really do care about them at least let them earn more and not put them into prison if they are victims why are you okay with putting them in prison so that's the thing that i think everyone can agree with but now let's talk about china and its relationship with canada because china has recently sentenced a canadian national michael spavor for providing state state secrets in other words espionage he was sentenced to 11 years in prison for that crime and this case is seen as somewhat of a retaliation for the jailing by canada of a Huawei executive. Spavor's conviction happened during the closing arguments at Canada Supreme Court over that Huawei executive, which was, by the way, an extradition case. So for you, for those of you who don't really know what extradition means, it's when someone is wanted for a crime in one country um, and that person is hiding or is residing in another country. So you just ask that other country, hey, could you send us over this person that we want to try or want to jail here in our, uh, in our country? So in this case, the United States uh, was asking Canada to extradite this Huawei executive, Meng Manzhou, um, who was allegedly connected to possible violations of trade sanctions on Iran and send him to the United States. So the reason why actually people are calling it hostage politics and the reason why people are calling it hostage politics is number one, even though Spavor is technically entitled to appeal his conviction, that's likely not going to work because China's justice system has a conviction rate of 99.9%. So China's justice system rarely if ever grants appeals. The second reason is because the sentence given to Spavor also included deportation, but it was unclear if the deportation will happen during the 11-year sentence, before the sentence is being served, or after the sentence is served. So we don't know the timeline for the deportation, but China has in the past deported foreigners that have not served prison sentences. So people say that the deportation and the time that they are going to deport him is an additional bargaining chip for Beijing. And Spavor, by the way, has been jailed in China since 2008. Now he has to spend even more time in jail unless Canada does something. And it's still debatable whether Canada should do something. And hostage politics is not new to the international scene. It's one of the main tools used in, in proxy war. A lot of people get affected by this. And I think it's interesting to watch the development that will take place. Speaking of proxy wars, we'll also have news about Afghanistan. So some more major Afghan cities fell to the Taliban this week as fighters took Herat the third largest city, along with two provincial capitals. U.S. Uh, officials are preparing to evacuate personnel from the country, and some say Kabul could be captured in 30 days. So development is happening rather quickly, and we think that this is related to a lot of the issues we discussed in previous weeks as well in relation to the Taliban. So we have to put this again in the context of the U.S. pulling out their forces. This is the Taliban acting in, in light of the U.S. gradually pulling out troops, this would also affect China's efforts to mediate between the Taliban and the Afghan government. As we mentioned, China wants to get into the mix, though we don't know what their involvement is going to look like yet. So what we know is, like what we said two weeks ago, China wants Taliban not to attack China, right? But given the recent developments, they might take a harder line stance, they might intervene, and might actually mediate more aggressively between the two nations. Similarly, we don't know how it would affect the Afghan people or government, especially in terms of how they will look at the U.S., especially in light of last week's story about the U how the U.S. is welcoming Afghan people who sided with them as refugees. 
But you might be able to argue that this would reasonably cause some degree of persecution from the Afghan government. Yeah, so I feel like this story is quite important because you do see that the Taliban is winning a lot of major battles lately. Another debatable thing, so there are several layers of debatable topics here. One is like, what should China do? Another is, what should America do? Another is, should we consider people as refugees? But another thing that I think might be important is, how should we treat or view the Taliban? because we might consider this as bad news from the perspective of the United States who believes that the Taliban is just a bunch of terrorists. But you also have to consider that the Taliban was funded and radicalized by the United States during the Cold War when they were like, hey, hey, school kids, have some textbooks that will probably radicalize you against communists like Russia or the USSR. And then when... <laughs> when the Taliban took control of the government and they were like, actually, we're radicalized not just against communism, but all Western imperialism. The United States was like, oh no, oh no, we have to depose these people again. So that's basically what happened. And that's the reason why you have all of this tension that's happening right now. But speaking of victims of communism, the victims of communism in East Germany have criticized Brandenburg's decision to subsidize Tesla, which you probably know is a manufacturer of electric cars. So the state of Brandenburg Brandenburg manages a trust fund for the benefit of victims of East European communist regimes from many decades ago. If you remember Stalin, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. So German media reported that the subsidy amounted to $10 million and will be used to pay for the infrastructure costs related to the Tesla Gigafactory being built on the outskirts of Berlin. And while the UOKG, which is an association representing these victims, said that they would welcome the construction of the factory, they still take issue with the state subsidizing basically a billion Billionaire, the third richest person in the world with money stolen from victims in the past. And this criticism is heavy considering that their spokesperson said that it could have been used to build schools, it could have been used to build homes for the elderly, memorials for the victims, those kinds of things. And it's a bit funny as well because not only was the move criticized by victims of communist Germany, but also by members of the opposition left party, which is the ideological successor to the same communist party that victimized those people long ago. So this is probably a move that everyone hates, right? Like the victims of the Communist Party are angry that money reserved for their benefit, that the money reserved for their benefit is not like is going towards Elon Musk and Tesla and the successor of the Communist Party is angry that the government is subsidizing a capitalist using public funds, but still allowing that capitalist to keep all the profits. But another interesting angle here is the fact that it's Tesla, which is a relatively greener technology that we should try to move towards. And this demonstrates that there are almost always trade-offs in the fight for climate justice. And you can also defend this decision by arguing that this is a worthwhile endeavor that will benefit the families of victims as well because it boosts the economy and can, albeit marginally for now, help future generations. Though we have to recognize that in the short term, of course, there's a lot of money that could have been used to build beneficial infrastructure for the short term. Speaking of Elon Musk and Tesla, let's also talk about one of his other passions, which is space. So in 2019, the US government promised to return to the moon by 2024. And NASA has been working to develop really, really good spacesuits that function as one person's space vehicles. So what that means is it will be a suit that will be absolutely sure that they can survive on the surface. What makes the spaceships or these suits so cool is that they have life support systems which recycle everything to make it livable for long periods of time. So basically, they turn urine into drinkable water, etc. The only problem is that a single suit apparently costs more than 1 billion US. So that's a lot of money, right? And lawmakers have said that they're not willing to fully pay for the project. So NASA got the help of SpaceX to pay for the creation of the suit. So Elon Musk is now joining up with NASA basically to create these suits. And it's even possible that SpaceX itself will step in to build the thing after the development or, and conceptualization of the plan. So more than the spacesuits, SpaceX has also successfully built a bid to build a rocket that will take the NASA astronauts to the moon. Blue Origin, however, a company founded by Jeff Bezos, also bid, but they weren't chosen. So there are rumors that Blue Origin will sue NASA to take them as a second private partner. The problem is that NASA doesn't really have enough money for both Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. So there's a lot of interesting things happening here. A lot of debatable topics that can exist through this news as well. Yeah, so one of them is why, why do we even want to go back to the moon? The other one is like how much funding should NASA get? To what extent are their operations beneficial to the public? But I feel like the most interesting thing is 
we have had debates in the past about whether or not we should privatize space exploration um, and whether or not we should celebrate that. But this is one of those examples where this is basically the privatization of space with just some input from government agencies like NASA. It seems like because we have so many problems going on right now, people are sort of catching on and going like, mm, we don't really need to fund NASA or SETI or the search for inter extraterrestrial intelligence anymore. Let's just focus on, you know, actual things that we are suffering from. And as a result, you have a lot of these billionaires just swooping in saying, oh, let's go to space. Let's try to escape this world that we have ruined for the poor so that we can live on Mars. And like, I feel like Elon Musk is the biggest, you know, person that you can point to and say that everything that they've been doing for the past years, including the boring company which tries to make like highways but they're actually just concrete tubes underground like a subway but for cars and all of that is just you know test drives for what they eventually want to make happen on mars instead of actually benefiting people here on earth so that's where we're at with the space story next thing that we're going to talk about is something that affects everyone um so this is the last you know portion of today's or tonight's episode which is about the environment so um again this affects a lot of people it actually affects everyone so the first story that we're going to talk about is australia's rat problem um australian farmers have been suffering from a rat plague recently and you would know that previously australia has experienced a drought that made their arable land quote unquote dust bowls according to the washington post they've also been suffering from like legitimate wildfires like australia was on fire the other month of this year or maybe last year i don't know the time blurs together in this dystopian world we're living in but anyway australian farmers were pleasantly surprised when rain started again this year making their silos overflow with grain they had bales of hay that were stacked tall enough to feed livestock for the coming years but the abundance came with a downside which is attracting thousands of rats and so this is where the plague happens they burrow deep into the hay or into people's like houses and their homes and their walls and their couches and their like refrigerators i'm not even exaggerating like they're everywhere to the point that a lot of farmers have had to send their families away because they literally could not sleep with all of the rats they could hear inside the walls and even when they tried to trap them or poison them they would die within the walls so they couldn't even get the smell out um so this is why it's quite dangerous because even though these plagues happen every other decade or so they are always dangerous because the growth of this population is exponential which is like two raised to nine because one pair of mice can generate 500 children and there aren't many good solutions and one of the debatable solutions is that the south wales government has got a hold of a thousand gallons of a deadly bait called bromadiolone but scientists worry that the poison might inadvertently kill other species like eagles owls snakes lizards that are currently feeding on the mice but at the same time they can't really wait for long because again they are very dangerous like they are vermin they're very dirty and in fact they can cause leptospirosis if some of the urine gets into like open wounds and in fact leptospirosis cases have doubled in 2021 and we're not even done with 2021 so some farmers have resorted to burning their own crops and that's basically where we're at but the reason why you put this under the environmental section of today's episode is that normally these plagues are self-correcting like the population gets too big but there's not enough food during the winter so they start going after each other start killing and eating each other because it's too cold and they can't eat anything else but if temperatures don't fall too low or if the temperatures aren't low enough for long enough then the plague won't end the like the population doesn't shrink enough to prevent that um infestation right so you end up just setting up an even bigger plague the next year and this is scary because with the global climate crisis that we're experiencing it has made winters less harsh overall so it's not as cold as it used to be it makes winters less widespread so in the united states alone only 10 percent of the united states has actually been experiencing extreme cold during the winters and it also makes the winter season that much shorter so that's a problem because because th that's a problem because 
the basically the climate crisis has basically almost doomed these people to years of a seasonal rat infestation that they might not be able to adapt to as quickly as they need to um which leads us to the next story which is a bit more optimistic if the last story was about you know a problem that it was hard to you know um adapt to our next story is about the thomas reuters foundation which gives a lot of updates um about climate change today or yesterday rather they gave a list of some ways that communities have found a way to cope or adapt to climate change so the first thing that you want to talk about here is a story about india which is currently like regularly suffering from 45 degrees celsius days and you have had women in slums painting their tin roofs with white reflective paint to lower the heat that they actually feel and this is important because it would be the people in the slums who would disproportionately feel the worst effects of climate change they don't have much resources with which to combat these effects if they're going to get flooded they're the ones who are going to suffer if you have 45 degrees celsius heat they're the ones who are going to suffer so that's the reason why they painted their roofs with white reflective paint so that they could reflect the heat back into space where it belongs and you know not to them so it would lower the heat that they actually feel and this might be seen as a victory especially since women are the ones pioneering this innovation but of course there's also questions of why does it have to be them like why does it reach this point that people who are suffering have to do things for survival and then they get lauded after i don't think it should reach that point but you know at this point in time with global warming and with the climate crisis we take every victory we can get so the next story here is that women in Zanzibar started growing sponges in the sea in order to find economic independence. So let's also talk about the successes of women in other areas. They used to farm fish and seaweed, but because of the rising sea temperatures, the seaweed yield has decreased and the fishes aren't showing up anymore. That's why they're now farming sponges. And some mothers have been using this to build houses as well as school their children as single mothers. So it's commendable because 90% of seaweed farmers on the island are women and majority of farmers in general are women. And this might be seen as something carried on from decades ago, as well as the social hierarchy that exists. But I think this points out that climate change isn't just an environmental issue. Not only is it an, an uh, economic issue, but it's also a feminist issue overall. So this is an example, not only of the effects of climate change, but also an example of the feminization of poverty. Yeah, next we can talk about Kenya since we're talking about farmers who are disproportionately female. Again, speaking of farmers in Kenya, farmers are using cotton waste biofuel to run their irrigation pumps, which you may know is the main way that they can ensure that water goes to their crops during times of drought by pumping water to these areas. But the biodiesel is cheaper than other fuels. And because it's, it's using cotton um, seeds, which is a byproduct of the process of creating cotton, it doesn't really need extra land and it's still environmentally cleaner. They use cotton seeds to make fuel better than diesel even, and they're using that fuel to make irrigation far more efficient. One Kenyan farmer even said that their earnings doubled in the past two years. In the past, bi biofuels have been rather controversial because while they are renewable, like you can plant corn and then turn that into biofuel, they also take up huge amounts of land and this leads to bad effects like for example driving forest communities off their land so that the land can be used to make the fuel which is what's happening in the soybean industry in places like brazil and it caused a lot of farmers as well to switch production from crops to be used for food to become crops to be used for fuel which makes food shortages even worse but this one again since but this one again since we're just talking about cotton seeds this is used as a byproduct of making cotton. So what used to be waste gets turned into fuel. Yeah, I think I feel like we've talked about like trade-offs before. This is another example of a trade-off that takes place. So while there is biofuel that's created, we also have to talk about food security and how that affects that. But I guess the next bit of news is about wildfires. We've talked about those in different sessions before and different episodes. But there seems to be an unexpected development in Europe where livestock farmers would set their goats and sheep loose on gra to graze dense forests so that there's less material for wildfire to feed on. 
And typically, you have to spend a lot on resources in making these things called fire breaks, right? Basically, what they do is that they stop wildfires from jumping from one place to another. And this is common, especially since we can't stop wildfires from happening naturally. It happens because of the reflection of the sun, when there's drought, when there's a lot of flammable material nearby. So by setting livestock loose, it becomes an unexpected way to make these uh, fire breaks, right? And they're actually called firefighters now, which I think is pretty cute to, be, to call livestock. Yeah, and speaking of firefighters and fire breaks, there have been cases where fire departments spend a lot of money in making fire breaks that have a really, really low chance of working, which ends up being very bad, very unstrategic use of resources. So number one, it was good that just using goats, using sheep, very inexpensive. But at the same time, as a parallel, like, you know, development, some people have created artificial intelligence tools to identify where these kinds of interventions would be more effective, like where these fires are more likely to occur, which fires are more likely to, you know, be stoppable, which places are fire breaks more effective, those kinds of things. And while fire is notoriously difficult to predict, now we are gathering just an abundance of data to help fire departments predict these problems before they even start. Another example of tech intersecting with environmentalism can actually be found in Indonesia, where you see people making apps that try to gamify forest conservation with Pokemon Go styled augmented reality. And the app is called Urandata, which encourages people to help map land across the Indonesian archipelago. So if you go to an area, you answer some simple question to earn points, and these questions will be about how the land is used, how for example, it looks, for example, and some people actually compete with each other. There's also a leveling mechanic to it, and now it's being crowdfunded. So I feel like that's interesting. Gamification or turning mundane tasks into games has always fascinated me. So I'm, I'm interested to see how the environment will benefit from this. Yeah, this is for me all good and, and inspiring news. We have to question whether it's sustainable. We have to ask why it's fair. As what Nina said earlier, that poor seaweed farmers and Indian slum dwellers have to bear the burden of adapting to climate change. But that's also debatable. There's a debate about whether we should try to even stop climate change or just try to adapt to it. And mostly that was, you know, created by a lot of Republicans say, oh, let's not fight climate change, let's just adapt to it. We can always adapt to it. And a lot of people are saying we can adapt to it by just ignoring those kinds of people. And that's personally where I am at. But also this week, also this week, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published their nearly 4,000-page report adding renewed energy to address the global climate crisis. We're reading it right now too, um, but it's really long, so we're going to try to develop a separate episode about it. But let's just look at some of the highlights pointed out by the Washington Post. The first being that it's unequivocal that human influence swarmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. And this is language that you usually do not see in the scientific community with this level of confidence. Because that's really not how the scientific community works. They use a process of induction, not deduction. So they're never 100% sure of anything. So it is very surprising and very, you know, um, laudable that they use terms like unequivocal in this time. So that, you know, no one says, oh, this, the science is still not clear. The scientific community is still not in agreement. So that's the reason why we're doing it. Um, just to be clear, the report actually has had more than 12,000, if I'm not mistaken, like more than 13,000 different citations to different, you know, studies. You've had 237 authors. So it's just very clear that there are mountains and mountains of evidence that all point to the same thing. So we shouldn't ever tolerate people going like, yeah, but the science isn't all there yet. But secondly, that the last decade was more likely than not. So it's not as confident, but, you know, they, they also found that the last decade was more likely than not warmer than any period for the past 125,000 years with warming to persist for the next few centuries even in the best case scenario so in, in essence there's no turning back now we can definitely mitigate those bad effects but there is no hope in not feeling any of the effects we are going to feel a lot of these effects but we still have hope in mitigating the worst of it but extremes like extreme drought and extreme flooding if you're worried about that that kind of thing will only get worse because of some process called evapotranspiration, which I'm reading up the science on now, again, in that 4,000-page report. But next week, or like maybe in the next 
few weeks, I'm going to make an episode about not just this report, but also what we can do about it. Because the main question that was running through my mind is that should I still be optimistic? And the reason and the answer that I found is yes, because a lot of the time it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And this book that I'm also concurrently reading about climate climate psychology says that a lot of people, they aren't really indifferent. They don't really care. They just don't want to act in particular ways because they are actually very depressed about it because they don't feel like they have any agency. They don't feel like they can control anything that will happen to them. Um, and that's the reason why they end up looking indifferent. It's basically a defense or coping mechanism that people have developed in, as a response to this climate crisis. So it really begins with us. And I'm not saying that it, it's all on us, like, you know, recycle, bamboo straws, stuff like that. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that if there was ever a reason for you to not lose hope, this would be it. So if you are like the type of person who is pessimist, I understand like the tendency towards pessimism. Mm. But at the same time, now more than ever, it is very crucial that you can believe that you can do something about it. It's very crucial that you believe that we are going to make it out of this, you know, alive, possibly, and, you know, hopefully all together, all in one piece. Um, so while there is no hope in feeling zero effects from climate change, there is still a lot of hope, in my opinion, that we can mitigate a lot of these negative effects that we can expect in the worst cases. So that's it for this episode. Uh, we're sorry that it was very late. Um, it was Friday the thirth. It was Friday the thirteenth yesterday. So we are blaming that. We're totally not blaming the fact that you know other things got in the way, or that there was just so much news um, lately. So we are still encouraging people to read up for themselves. Another thing that we really wanted to talk about but didn't get the chance to is the fact that Maria Ressa um, got acquitted. Um, in one of her cyber libel cases, but we didn't feel like there was that much to talk about there. Maybe in a future episode where there are like future developments there. But that's it for this episode. We hope that you liked it. Um, we hope that you remain optimistic. Despite all the doom scrolling that may exist, like the reason why we give you news isn't so that you feel bad, right? It's to stay informed. And I feel like there needs to be a healthy balance that exists to ensure that while you are staying informed, you're not dooming yourself to pessimism. So take a lot of the things we say, internalize them, but don't let them bound you, right? Climate change, for example, is really bad now, but it doesn't have to stay that way. And I feel like that's something we have to hold on. So that's it for this episode of Debatable. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.